Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Today, we're talking about an extremely important topic in our province, and that's our population state of health and our healthcare system. Newfoundland and Labrador has startling health statistics. We have Canada's worst life expectancy and its highest rates of chronic disease. We have the worst performance in healthcare in spite of a 232% increase in health spending since 1981. That means dollar for dollar, we have the worst value for health spending in the country. Newfoundland has also experienced a swing in its population demographics where we now have a low proportion of children and a high proportion of seniors. One of the main factors, of course, is that our healthcare system is a 50-year-old institution-based system with imbalances between community-based services and hospital services. Well, in response to these startling healthcare facts, on November 5th, 2020, the Honorable Andrew Fury, Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, and the Honorable John Hagee, Minister of Health and Community Services, announced that Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis have been appointed co-chairs for the Task Force on Health, known as the Health Accord NL. Well, they're with me here today to tell us more about the Health Accord NL and what it means for us here in the province. Let's check it out. Hi, Sister Elizabeth. Hi, Dr. Parfrey. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well, thanks for taking the time today. I know you're both extremely busy, along with the other people that are involved. Can you give our listeners a background on what your project is and why it's underway? Well, it's the Health Accord Newfoundland and Labrador, and each piece of that is important. When the Premier and the Minister of Health and Community Services decided that it was we really needed to look at health in the province, I suspect they thought we would look more at health care, not just at health. But as we began to explore where we were going here, we realized the ultimate issue is health. How do we strengthen the health of the province? And we realized very early on the only way we could do that is by engaging with people that we did not have, it made no sense for us to speak on behalf of the people of the province. So the accord piece of this is a part that says we engage with government, certainly. We engage with many stakeholder groups who have all kinds of interests in health and health care. But ultimately, we have to talk to the people of the province. It's their health, their province, their say, one of the taglines we use. And it's for this province of Newfoundland and Labrador. So when we began the work, uh, the two of us were appointed by the premier and the minister. And then we in turn worked with the with both of them to name a task force that has very broad representation from the community, from the medical school, from the unions, from each party. So a broad based group. From that, we set up six strategy committees looking at what we believe to be key elements of health. So we're, we have the, the six committees, are the social determinants of health, the community care committee, the uh, hospital services committee, aging population, quality of care, and then digital technology. And then ultimately we set up four working groups across those six strategy groups, one looking at governance, one looking at interdependence among the governments, federal, provincial, municipal, indigenous, and provincial. The third one is around workplace readiness, looking at human resource planning and at education. And so this is the work that began to unfold and has been unfolding since last November. And I would I'd say, Dr. Parfrey, uh, answer to that too is, why is there a need to look at the health of our province? <clears throat> there are several crises all occurring at the same time. Uh, there's a health crisis in that our life expectancy has gotten worse over the last 20 years. The difference between us and Ontario in 1981 was one year. Now it's 2.6 years. Uh, we've, got the, we've got the highest provincial rate of cancer, heart disease and stroke. And we have the highest prevalence of chronic diseases in seniors in the country. So that's the health piece. And, and on top of that, there's been a very substantial demographic change. Uh, the population of the province has dropped by about 8%. And that has not been uh, uniform. It's occurred in rural areas in particular. There's a 42% drop in the Northern Peninsula, 
you know, south the south coast, about a 40% drop, Durham Peninsula, the same thing. And the drop has occurred in young people, people below the age of 34, in children and in, in, uh, in young adults, because of out-migration associated with the Cod Maritorium. So that demographic change has been extremely substantial. On top of that, we have a, uh, a, a fiscal crisis, as everybody knows about, and, and we have a climate change uh, cri- crisis that, uh, it, that does interfere with health, particularly in Labrador, where people have difficulty uh, with more fog and more bad weather than they've had previously. So it affects their capacity to get, get emergency therapy. And then there's a sustainability crisis within the health system, as you probably know about now. We've got the deficit of, uh, of family practitioners. We've got chaos in rural areas and primary care. Um, we've got a lack of nurses and specialists in the hospitals. Um, so these five crises have come together at the same time, demanding that a plan should take place or should be produced. And because we need a, a holistic and integrated solution, it's going to take time to put the plan into place and it's going to t- take time for it to, to, to function. So that's why we've called it a 10-year transformation, even though the plan that we will come up with will probably be a five-year plan. That was such an interesting thing when I read the report, how the demographics have changed. When we look at the rates of, of seniors and, and the population shifts, can we just go a little bit deeper into that so people can really understand how much they've changed? Because the system was designed 50 years ago for a much different population, which is why it needs to be revamped, right? So if you look at 50 years ago, we had 200,000 children under the age of 15, and we had 30,000 people over the age of 65. 50 years later, we have 70,000 children under the age of 15. So we've gone from 200,000 to 70,000. And on the good news side, over 65, we have 120,000 people. So we've gone from 30,000 to 120,000. When you have a really young population, there will be more acute illness, and that will be where your focus is. So the the hospitals will have many pediatricians. We will be focusing solely on, pretty significantly on acute kinds of problems, not solely, but significantly. When you have an older population, you will tend to focus on chronic illnesses. And you heard Pat say that we have a higher uh, the incidence of chronic illness among older people than the rest of the country has. What is also skewed for us is the population has not only changed overall, but as Pat said, more people have moved to urban areas. So we have fewer and fewer people in rural areas. And that really complicates matters because it challenges sustaining physicians and nurses and sustaining the kinds of community services you need to support communities. Even as we have fewer and fewer young people, young adults to support community activities and more and more older people in need of more support. So it's complicated both on the health system side and on the social factors that support our health side. Right, and we're gonna dive into those social factors because they're such a critical part as well as health literacy today. But about the project, before we move off of that, you know, there was three phases that were outlined. What are they and what do you hope to achieve in each aspect of the project? So in phase one, we felt that what we needed to do was to determine the directions that we needed to go to across all our committees and then engage with the public to see whether we got those directions right. So it wasn't really about implementation. It was about where where we wanted to get to. So we went out into the public and we got great feedback in that we had fairly good, we had very good agreement about the directions we needed to get to, uh, but we got feedback that we didn't get it entirely right. And in particular that we, that we missed out on areas that were, would be necessary to be cross cutting across these six committees. And they turned out to be around governance, around interdependence with other uh, governments around the uh, mix and distribution of providers, the education of providers, and health literacy. So that's why we set up those four working groups who are kind of coming in in the middle, appropriately enough actually, because they, they need to, to know what the plan is to be able to determine what should happen in those particular areas. Mm-hmm. So that they just started up now in terms of uh, trying to answer the questions that are relevant to them. Mm-hmm. So that was phase one. Mm-hmm. And phase two was we went 
and we wrote our interim report about phase one, which is the the, uh, the directional statements, etc. And then phase two was to come up with a framework of change and go into the public arena again and get feedback from the public and the stakeholders and everybody else about this framework, which was definitely not carved in stone, which was really something to... Because we felt that if we if we went out there with the solutions, that's not engagement. We went out with a framework so people could tell us what the appropriate solutions were. And the, the framework has changed as a result of that. So we're we're in the in the process now of coming up with specific implementation actions that will be discussed at the task force in the next month. And then we we'll go back out into the public arena again with those particular ideas. So that's phase three, really, is what are we actually going to do and what pushback are we going to get about it? Do we get it right or do we get it wrong? Or in phase two, we can't divide it up into two pieces. One was about the health system itself, about community care, about the hospitals, the aging population. And we left the other three areas for a subsequent discussion, which is going to occur in the next month. And that's around dominantly around the social terms of health but will also concern quality care and uh, digital technology. We're learning about the Health Accord NL from co-chairs Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're learning about the Health Accord NL from co-chairs Sister Elizabeth Davis and Dr. Patrick Parfrey. Let's get back to our interview. So I think that's really important for folks that are listening to understand the degree of consultation and the broad scope of people that were brought into this as opposed to this is the way it's going to be. It's not. You tell us the way, and that's a really important point for them. Now, I want to get into something that folks may not understand as well, and this is going to be directed at you, Sister Elizabeth, and this is about the social determinants of health. Can you explain what those are to our listeners? When we look at our health as individuals or as populations, we realize that the healthcare system itself only comes in when there's a problem or a challenge. So what makes us, keeps us healthy or what causes us not to be so healthy? We know from around the world, and this is true whatever country you live in, it's not unique to Canada or to Newfoundland and Labrador, that there are certain indicators of health that correlate with health. We know if you're poor, your chances are higher that you're not healthy. We know if you're not well-educated, the chances are higher you're not as healthy. We know if you don't have a good social safety net, if you don't have a a group of friends or family around you who support you in challenging times, that your health won't be as good. We also know that we're learning more and more, this is relatively new in our awareness, that if you feel excluded for any reason, because of your race, because of your religion, because of your gender, that that is going to affect your health. Now, we all know that, you know. We, we probably don't use the word social determinants of health, but we know instinctively those things are true. We also know that the environment matters. Climate change does matter. And if you're living in many parts of the world today that are hit by extreme weather, whether it's more vicious hurricanes lasting longer, or, or it's uh, dry spells, droughts that are lasting longer, that has to affect your health, both of the person and of the group. What we don't always know is which ones of these have the most impact on our health. That we don't know as well. We haven't had as much research, but certain ones do, we know for sure. Poverty is one of the wounds we know. And poverty has many faces. It, it, it affects our food security. What kind of good food can we afford to buy for our family? It affects our home life. Now, there are many homeless people in this country and many people living in houses that are not really decent for human living. We also know it affects how you can go to school, how you can be in school. We know poverty affects so many aspects of our lives, including how others look at us and whether we're included in conversation or excluded. So poverty is one of those areas that has so much stereotype around it that is a major indicator of health. Another major indicator is that we're sure of is intervention in early childhood. 
the stronger the support is there for the mom and the family before the child is born, the stronger support there when the child is very young, the better the health outcome will be both for the family and for the child. We have, we have good evidence around that. So we also know in this province, even though we think of ourselves as being very inclusive, there is a significant presence of systemic racism. Our indigenous people and communities have talked to us about that, their experience with that. We also know people coming in from other countries, if they're if from more from black countries, have that same experience of exclusion. So how do we create a more inclusive society is part of the challenge we're facing as well. So when we look at how healthy we are, you heard Pat talk about death from stroke, cancer, heart disease. These are all related to economic, social, environmental factors. So while we need the hospitals to care for us when we have those diseases, we also though need to make sure that we prevent them as much as we can or we mitigate them as much as we can. So we need to be very much more focused on how do we reduce poverty? How do we become inclusive? How do we make sure that we're part of that movement to protect our climate? These are big, big pieces that will take years to actually show us a difference. And what experts in this area tell us is people will totally agree with everything I just said, but won't agree to pay for it. So Pat would tell you that if we look from 40 years ago, our health expending expenditure has increased by 236% on the healthcare system, social spending by 6%. So while we agree with everything I just said, we don't put our money where our mouth is on this one. I, I did. I, I just wanted to, to, to say something about the, the, the biggest demographic event that's occurred in this province for th at least three generations was the Cod Moratorium. We, what, what happened after that was that there was out-migration of 57,000 young people, but life expectancy decreased. And at the same time as life expectancy decreased, and I can try and explain that in a minute, there was this massive increase in medical spending that did nothing to be able to influence that life expectancy number. So there, the, and my, the explanation that we've got is, is that one, one thing happened was there was an increase in death rates because there was more older people when the younger people left. But on top of that, it looks like as if the healthier people left and the less, less healthy stayed be, uh, behind and their death rates went up and that affected life expectancy. And the other thing that we can't really rule out is that there were adverse effects because of the social consequences of the COD moratorium. And at that time, we had flat social spending. Right. That makes, that makes sense. There was a lot of stress. There was a lot of changes in socioeconomic status during that period of time, of course. And so that brings me to the next question I have, you know, in the survey, 83% of respondents said that the way that we receive regular health care from providers needs to change. What were some of the themes that emerged from that? And what does that really mean to change the way we receive health care? The thing that concerns people at the moment is access to primary care. And uh, we know that access is not good, particularly in rural areas, but it's even occurring in, in ur urban areas as well. Um, our feeling, uh, based on data, is, is that the way we deliver care should, should be more team-based. Um, people would be more attracted to working in teams, that it should be have a much wider base of providers so that not only are family doctors available, so are nurse practitioners and nurses, but also allied health professionals like physiotherapists and occupational therapists and social workers, et cetera. And then, and then on top of that, other people that people forget about are important in the health system like uh, paramedics particularly advanced care paramedics or pharmacists working to the full scope of their practice. So the idea that we're propagating is that we need community teams present in every region of this province that, that the, every person in this province can access and that is dependent on a rostering principle so that they have a, they, everybody has access to these types of uh, professionals. And the, the public understood that from what they were saying to us. I think another thing the public said to us is that we have to develop better virtual care. Mm. You know, that if we want to have reach right across the province, 
one of the ways to do that today, which we wouldn't have had 30 years ago, is quite significant advance in virtual care. And I don't mean the telephone. I mean, face-to-face -face like we're speaking today. And obviously dependent on the person's choice, obviously. But we have, we know across the world now, there are major advances in how virtual care can be done that reaches out to the most remote and rural areas, but it also allows less travel, you know, less waiting for appointments, that kind of thing. Done properly, however, and done carefully, methodically. So the Digital Technology Committee is doing quite a lot of work in that area. But we also know, even from our present election promises, that there is a fairly strong commitment to make sure the whole of the country is accessible by technology now, as it is not today, but needs to be. And uh, we've been told as early as 2026, the majority of the country will have that kind of access. We're learning about the Health Accord NL from co-chairs Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're learning about the Health Accord NL from co-chairs Sister Elizabeth Davis and Dr. Patrick Parfrey. Let's get back to our interview. When you polled people at the various town halls, it showed the social determinants of health was the biggest factor people saw. But the second one was diet and exercise. Now, this is a world that I came from. How did that evolve or how did that come out in the conversation? And what were the areas you think you can improve on that? So, um, I mean, we, we didn't ask that question. The people told us that question. Um, and they, there was a, a strong belief that those uh, arenas were places that we could get into. I think that it, it is a bit more complicated than just exercising uh, more and eating them less and smoking less because a lot of that is driven by the social circumstances of the people. So it's probably influenced by the social determinants of health. And also it goes into this area of health literacy. Do people understand why these things are happening? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, what was one of the most surprising things of a survey that has, was done by the regional health authorities was that people did understand that they needed to do exercise more, decrease stress, uh, eat better. Uh, but all of them said that, it, not all of them, the vast majority said they didn't do it for reasons that they, they actually, they said things like, uh, I haven't the willpower. I don't have enough money to do it. And they didn't think that they were going to change those lifestyle components of their, uh, in, their, in their lives. You know, health literacy is sort of the next thing I want to chat about. Why is that so important and how can we get at that? Do we get at that for just the next generation coming or do we start educating people that have already been through the education system but are older and have to be educated in a new phase of life? That's a really complex question you're asking us. Mm -hmm. uh, health literacy applies to the individual but also to the population. In terms, uh, we've been having a numbers of conversations with the school districts the English and the French school district. And they are very much committed to comprehensive school health programs that really do look not just at the response to illness, but they look at how do we prevent illness and how do we have healthier lives. That's a Im very important uh, movement that's happening right now in the province. It's happening globally. The province is very much part of that, not moving as quickly as they would like or we would like, but it's certainly a move in the right direction. We're also very conscious, though, when we talk about lifestyle, that I really don't have the right to tell you what your lifestyle should be. There's very much an autonomy here that should be based, though, on an understanding of, of the kinds of things that do affect our lives. And, uh, but it's useless to say to me, you should be giving your children healthier food. If I'm a single mom with three children under the age of five living on social welfare. Mm -hmm. You telling me that I'm not doing a good job in feeding my children is not helping me or those children or not making anybody healthier. It's making me feel more guilty. I can't do anything about it. So it just deepens the situation you know, I'm in as opposed to helping out. So we have to be very conscious of that kind of naming and blaming that's way too frequent among us. But we also have to be conscious about something we spoke about earlier 
we all nod and agree about the social factors, and the economic factors, and the environmental factors that influence our health, but we're not willing to put the money into them. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's, a, a, there's a strange loop that happens here, not just in this province, but it happens everywhere. Whereas we acknowledge all these things, but because there's no immediate impact, it'll take quite a few years before we see the impact of any of those slight changes. Whereas something that we get in the hospital or we get a pill from the doctor seems to have a more immediate impact. And somehow that is a big challenge for us as a health board. How do we get individuals? How do we get governments? How do we get private sector leaders? How do we get all of us buying into this and then putting money into making those changes, knowing that it'll take 10, 15, 20 years before we see good outcomes? Well, yeah, and I've got to think that, you know, one of the areas that would be help is early intervention as well as education so that people aren't as severe when they go see a doctor. But uh, Dr. Parfrey, uh, one of the things that came up was primary health care is a challenge for people. What are the solutions? Will that be encompassed in something like virtual health care? Well, we've discussed part of the solutions there. And we think that the most important action that we're going to take uh, will be around these community teams. That, that, that those community teams would provide the glue that would hold the system together. It would attempt to Im improve the primary care problem. It would link and integrate with the, the in a, a comprehensive school health policy, which we think is really important. Um, and it's that link between health and the educational system that will, will probably have the biggest impact on health literacy. That, at least that will, that's what we perceive. We do think that, as Sister Elizabeth said earlier, that the virtual care agenda is really something really important to us and that we can't push back on it. We've got to jump in and do whatever we can to ensure that this works properly. A combination of broadband access to everybody in the province. We've only got 72% of households currently with broadband access. So if you can't get it in Labrador, it's of no, be it's, it's of no benefit to them. And then the, uh, the whole idea of people living in communities actually are capable of accessing broadband and the idea that communities take responsibility for people that live in their communities and help them get broadband. And then that the health system, that they function in a manner that allows them to make a better judgment of what, what ails people. So to me, if you've got a new medical problem, going on the telephone as a family doctor is not really great. You need, you need to see the patient at least on visual virtual technology and then make a decision whether you have to examine the patient. So I think that this entire arena of uh, virtual care and its infrastructure and the need for health information systems is really, really important to us, I, I, us as a province. And I think two other pieces of that, just adding to the importance of those community teams, the other group that are really important in this are the municipalities because the local communities have built infrastructure to or not to support people in maintaining their health. So it's, it's useless to say to older people, you should walk more if there's no safe place where they can walk, safe in terms of underfoot, safe, or safe in terms of being protected from other kinds of problems. So we've talked uh, on a number of cases with the municipalities to really strongly encourage them to be part of this conversation as well from the point of view of the kinds of communities, elder-friendly communities, age-friendly communities that they are working to create. So one of the things that I want to talk about, this was something that also came up with the Minister of Health when we chatted last, was addictions and mental health. And they're becoming more prominent in healthcare. They may not be more prominent in our society. They just might be more out in the open now because the stigma is being reduced. What are some of the things that need to change in that? So we, we got a, a, a large amount of uh, feedback in our public engagement about mental health and addictions. And one of our answers was that, that there's an all party conference of, uh, of the political parties that come together to come up with recommendations for this area. And we didn't want to be going over that area again because m many of those recommendations had, uh, were being imp implemented. Um, but, but there were a few things that were, came out as been important to us. One was that the school system is so important. Um, and this, this idea of an integrated school health program is really critical and has not yet been implemented. 
So I think that one of the areas that we, we will make a recommendation on is how that should go ahead because you, you need to integrate the professionals that are in schools and the professionals that are in the health system. And there are more of them in the health system than there are in the schools. And you need to have it all year long. That doesn't stop when the schools close. So that piece is, is going to be really important to us. And then there were pieces of it that kind of, I suppose, upset us in that uh, access to, to these type of professionals was delayed in certain instances because of silos and uh, getting rid of the silos would be so important to the child. And then the other area that was influential, I think, was the experience in the Durham Peninsula where they had a number of suicides and that the, the kind of the um, traditional psychiatry model wasn't really functioning very well. Uh, and they decided to create a community team approach, integrating psychiatry and p- people in the community to try and be proactive about what was going on with their, with their youth. Um, and it appears that that has been really successful. And then the other piece that's obviously pr- pretty important is, is the role of the social, social system in, in these arenas. Um, so we will be commenting on those types of things without trying to repeat what the all-party committee had undertaken. We're quite conscious, as Pat said, of that integrated approach to that. It's not separate from health. It's part of health. There's no, it's not stigmatized outside as it has been in the past. It's part and parcel of what we mean by health. We're also conscious that it's, it's an integrated response needed in terms of the professionals on the health side and on the social side in order to respond because it's generally chronic illness. And we're also mindful of that in terms of when I talked earlier about inclusion being an important social determinant of health, mental health is often very highly correlated with other forms of exclusion. And we really, one of the two lenses through which our report is being done is the lens of inclusion. And we're, 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 even, we're more mindful today of the importance of that than we were when we started last November, that we really have to look at inclusion in all the levels in society to see how, how it really plays out in terms of the health of people. One group of people, for example, which tend to be very much stigmatized and excluded are prisoners. And how, how, does, how do we work in terms of mental health and addictions primarily in, in protection of people who are imprisoned? Uh, we look at it in terms of homelessness. There's a very high correlation usually between physical health, mental health, addictions and homelessness and poverty. So how do we address the complexity of those issues, which are not as rare as we would like to believe? So it's the integration piece is so important from the stereotyping and stigmatizing to the way you analyze the issues to how we respond. We're learning about the Health Accord NL from co-chairs Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're learning about the Health Accord NL from co-chairs Sister Elizabeth Davis and Dr. Patrick Parfrey. Let's get back to our interview. You know, one thing we'll start talking about now is the conclusions of your report. You had visions set for each of these areas. Now, I know that you've since gone and had public consultation, but can you summarize what the vision is for each one of these key areas? Not yet. (laughs) The vision is unfolding as we speak and the engagement that we're having with the people of the province plus stakeholder groups continues to modify that vision, continues to nuance it. But from the beginning, we said in the same sentence, we need to look at social determinants of health and the health system. Mm -hmm. So the two together, and most studies don't do that. Most studies look at one or the other. So right to the end, we will be constant about that. We will be constant that there are social determinants of health that we must intervene in, that we must begin to make a difference in now if we're going to see the, the fruits of that down the road. We also know the health system itself has to change. And we've talked about reimagining that system all through our conversation today. So that part of our vision we're standing with. 
we're also very clear in terms of the vision that, as Pat said, one of the main pillars is that community team approach that covers a geographic area and a population in that area. I may not be sick today, but I need to know where my health team is when I do become ill. And they need to know that in my chronic illness now I'm good, but I, at any point I would need their support. We're also very cognizant of the two lenses we, which overplay all of what we're looking at in terms of the vision, inclusion being one, quality being the other, and within quality, sustainability. So if we can't recruit certain groups of professionals for an area of the province, how do we make sure the people of that province get the proper responses around health and health care? So these are some key parts of that vision that will unfold. Well, I think, I think sustainability is the biggest issue for us uh, because uh, in the presence of the things that have happened from a demographic perspective and the capacity to be able to recruit into smaller areas, it is undoubtedly present. And uh, people in those areas don't like that. And so, but, uh, as you can imagine, but uh, we're forced to come up with well, what is the best solution to provide services uh, to those people so that they are able to access hospital services and regional health or regional hospital services and tertiary care services and that component is is a challenge uh, that we're still engaged with and we're we're what we try to tell people is we're on two paths we're on a path of engagement to see what people think and proper engagement and then at the same time we've got the hospital services committee are uh, evaluating evidence about the health system to work out what would be the best thing to do to sustain the system. So those two pathways are going to meet in the next month or so as we kind of come up with our, our action plan. And a key part of our vision is none of this is going to happen unless everybody takes a leadership responsibility. And by everybody, we just, just don't mean the government leaders. They're elected by us to make those decisions. We expect them to make them. But we also expect the same of the leaders in the public sector institutions, whether they're in schools or universities or health regions. We expect that kind of leadership from the private sector, from the leaders in the private sector, and we expect it from the media. So if we, we really are serious about making this province not the unhealthiest province in Canada, but the healthiest province in Canada, we know what we have to do. That's not the issue. The issue is here, have we got the courage and the willingness to work together to make it happen? And that's a leadership challenge. We really need to motivate leaders everywhere to take this responsibility, each in their own way. That's the strength of this. We haven't spoken at all in our conversations about the hundreds of community groups out there of, who are working so hard with very little resource to make a difference in their communities. So that civic society linked with the government and the public system, we can turn this around. But it will only happen if we all do it together. No one group there, whether it's government or the private sector or community groups or the health system, no one group can do this on their own. So it's a major challenge to every leader in this province to step up here and be counted and make the difference. That's right. And if we want people to be engaged, they have to know how to keep track of what you guys are up to. How can people follow your project and what's current? Well, we have a, we have a website that everything is on called Health Accord NL. It's easily accessible. There are surveys for people to fill out to communicate with us. There are multiple quantitative questions and qualitative questions. By, by those, I mean open-ended questions that people can give their opinions. We have people who are analyzing those opinions, uh, qualitative researchers, um, and that information has been fed into the task force uh, as part of the engagement process. We will also have two more rounds of public engagement, one in October and one in November, that are all advertised on our website, but we're also on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, all under Health Accord NL. And we're sending out some postcards to people just to make them aware of how they can connect. But the most important thing is everybody's hearing this from you today, Mike, needs 
to tell their friends about this, not to agree with what we're saying, but to be part of the conversation with what we're saying so we can build up this momentum throughout the whole province. When we send our report in at the end of the year, early January, we don't want that to be one more report to be placed on a shelf. Yeah. We want it to be a living document that's organic and that people will track well beyond where we are in January 1st, 2022. And Pat, do you wanna speak one minute about that? Because the report itself will end in a couple of months, but we're talking about a 10 year transformation and some of the thinking we have about how we maintain attention to this over the next 10 years. But I think uh, there, there are, this, the task force was set up specifically to engage the stakeholders. And by that we meant the, in particular, the unions and the regional health authorities who could potentially be at loggerheads and we specifically have engaged with the uh, Liberal Party and the PCs and the NDP, so they know what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we will get agreement across all parties and, and accept if there are differences, that this health accord must be implemented. And I think we'll be recommending uh, processes by which that, that can be implemented. For, in for instance, the... Uh, uh, um, the Premier's Task Force in Education had a secretariat in the Premier's office. Something similar may be, may be relevant for this uh, task force because unless the, the organisation is put into effect to transition, to change, we just have wasted our time. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is there anything you guys want to leave the listeners with before we close up our interview today? I'd just like to add one, one point. We, we have on each of those three, six co committees and uh, four working groups, we have 11 people, uh, all vested in the, in the uh, um, content of their task, so to speak. And then on the task force, we've got something like 24 people who, who are equally, they're not, their job now is going to become more difficult because they're going to get um, action plans that they may or may not like that, that, that by, and for which we must, uh, the differences we must discuss and how we go forward with those differences. But that you can, that's, a, that's 135 people have been actively engaged intellectually heavily uh, for the last year. Uh, one of the issues we haven't spoken to is the relationship between the provincial government and the indigenous governments in the, in the province. Uh, we, we are very aware that the health status of Indigenous members of this province is lower than that of the rest of us, and that's not acceptable. We're also quite respectful of the governance structures of each of the Indigenous communities. So that's an important area of how to, again, work better together than we're doing now to, uh, to strengthen the health of all of us in the province. The second point I would make is that as long as we are unhealthy as a province, we're never going to be healthy economically. The, the, poverty, the correlation between poverty and economy is quite strong. The poorer we are, the sicker we are. The sicker we are, the poorer we are. So if we don't intervene in both, we're not going to, together, we're not going to have the outcome that we need. And my final point is, we're, this is for all of us. We don't want the record of having the worst health outcomes of every province in Canada. That is not a record we want to win. And we can't turn that around. One of us can't turn that around. 200 of us can't turn that around. That's got to be a full province response here. All of us, public sector, private sector, institutions, community groups, individuals, and government, pulling together to make that record disappear and we help us move further to the middle and eventually to the top in terms of the health of the people of the province. We deserve no less than that. Mm. But in this case, we together have to make it different. Excellent. Well, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, Sister Elizabeth, Dr. Parfrey, thank you so much for taking the time today. And thank you and to your teams for dedicating yourselves to such an important project for the province. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having us on, Mike. Great help. Thank you to my guests for joining me today. 
it certainly sounds like there's a lot of positive insights and areas of change in store for the health of our province. I think that the statements around us taking a role in our own health is a key takeaway as well. So for that, I'll say thank you for listening to today's show. Well, that's a wrap for today. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.